on. And uh, Douglas, you were telling us about um, the teleportation gates. Yes, and how um, the Japanese uh, population was evacuated en masse. What they were evacuated by was the ancient Muvayan priesthood, which was a matriarchy. And the priestesses, the matriarchy thereof, they uh, were unable to use those same teleportation gates to evacuate physically because they were effectively manning the gates, so to speak. In other words, because they were running the gates or manipulating them, they could not put themselves through them uh, manifestly, materially, physically, bodily, corporeally. Therefore, they evacuated incorporeally. Spiritually, they committed to metempsychosis. Metempsychosis is transmigration of the soul. And they relocated to the Japanese home islands as those spirits which became the Shinto nature spirits. Ah. This was the source of the Shinto nature spirits that settled in the mountains and in the rivers and in the landmarks of Japan that became the foundation for their religion, where their spirits oh. were immortal, but tied to the earth. That now, makes a lot of sense, actually. Thank you. And uh, this is the uh, ancient uh, tradition that was guarded by Japan's occult bureau. Now, the horror of the situation today is that people need to understand that one of Aquino's, Michael Aquino, who we've explained in our last transmission, we'll delve into again tonight, but one of his propagandists, an acolyte of his in England, where he had established churches, what he called pylons, or branch churches of the Temple of Set, was the woman who wrote Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling's. She became a multimillionaire supported by the Temple of Set, producing books about Harry Potter, which is a perversion of the ancient Vedic Hindu term, Hari Puttar, son of God. When huh. she wrote these books about the son of God, Hari Puttar, but pervert it, invert it satanically into Harry Potter, like a hairy beggar, a Potter meaning a beggar, in the English words, then she's committing this satanic inversion in which she portrays the Japanese Occult Bureau. So whenever anybody looks up the Japanese Occult Bureau, all you're going to find is Harry Potter. <laughs> so understand, you have to know how to spell, at least in the romanization. Now, I understand most people can't write this in Japanese, wouldn't know how to enter it on the computer in Japanese. So you're going to have to spell it in the Latin alphabet, on Murio. That's O N M Y O R Y O. On Murio. I don't the remember a Japanese occult bureau in Harry Potter, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry? Where was that? I don't remember I, a, 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 Jap a Japanese occult bureau in Harry Potter. You know, I never read the Harry Potter works, but I know one thing. Everybody who I was talking to about the Japanese Occult Bureau, every time they look it up, all they find is Harry Potter. <laughs> I can tell you that. So apparently there's reference to a Japanese Occult Bureau in Harry Potter. Okay, okay. Because this is what keeps coming up for most people on their searches, in the United States at least. Uh, so uh, now Japanese wizards are known as on Myoji. And the that's O N M Y O J I. Uh, so the Onmyoji. Just so people understand, you're also going to get profoundly misleading history. Uh, obviously, uh, the one thing that Emperor Hirohito did, being a scientist and wanting his people to um, essentially progress in a more materialist and rationalist direction. He made the Onmyorio, the occult bureau, secret. So understand that if you look in Japanese history, at least translate it into English, you're not going to find, you're going to find all this stuff about, oh, then the Japanese outlawed it. 
then the Japanese uh, yeah, basically uh, you don't have one functioning. All of this is bullshit. Technically, the Onmyorio still exists. It was abolished so that the West would not know about it during the Meiji Restoration, which happened during the American Civil War. Um, you see this popularized um, somewhat accurately uh, through the movie with Tom Cruise, uh, Peter Moon's fellow Scientologist, in The Last Samurai. Uh, now, there's a lot I don't like about the film. Namely, it's got Tom Cruise, but <laughs> all of that <laughs> gives people a good idea of what happened in general. But it happened at the same time as America's Civil War, essentially. Um, so the Meiji Restoration was Japan's Civil War, in which the samurai were effectively uh, declassified, meaning they lost their class status, and the emperor uh, defeated them with a European-trained peasant army using modern technology. So this Meiji Restoration, in which the emperor took all secular power, uh, took it back after a thousand years of samurai rule, when the emperor did that, then you had uh, simultaneously in the middle of the war, the death of the last uh, proper on Myoryo Grand Master, uh, Mikado Haruo, one of the few people to have the word emperor in his very name, Mikado, meaning emperor. Mikado Haruo died, but its functions were split into three organizations, two of which fell under the purview of the Imperial Japanese Navy. But one, the astrology department, was allowed to exist under Tsuchimikado Herinaga. Notice the similar similarity there to Harry Potter. Uh, Herinaga, of course, being a Japanization of the word breath, hare, as in harikiri, which is a not a proper Japanese word. It's an Anglo bastardization to describe suicide by cutting open the belly, the belly and releasing the breath of life itself, harikiri. Uh, hari combined with nyaga, naga being the snake people, the people, uh, giant serpents with the minds of men that were guides for humanity. Uh, the ancestors of Buddha, who is said to be of the nyaga, the serpent lineage. This is a fact most people don't know. So the very name, Harinaga, the breath of the serpent, Tsuchimikado, the emperor of the serpent breathers, was the last Onryo no Kami, uh, master of the spirits, for a while, before it was abolished and absorbed into the Jingi Khan in 1872. The Jingi Khan was abolished just to appeal to the world. It wasn't because the Americans even asked for it to be abolished. Indeed, they never knew about it. But because the Japanese didn't want the world to know about it, Emperor Hirohito wanted to appear as a scientifically modern nation and start trade with the world since they had won the war, even though they were still dictating their terms to the Americans and in talk down process negotiations, uh, the Jingi Khan was abolished so that Japan would appear very modern and its functions were absorbed into the Imperial Household Agency itself as the Shikibu Shoku, the Board of Ceremonies. So the Board of Ceremonies, which still performs many of the old ritual functions of the Onmyorio, it's simply the latest of which the series of divinations on the enthronement of the new emperor. Uh, it's the postmodern day version and descendant of the An Myorio, which my mother was a part of. So this is a wizard's bureau that is thousands of years old. And uh, the An Myorio uh, were the people who uh, helped Japan win the war in their own way. Uh, there were many factors, of course, in winning the war. Uh, but the An Myorio was one of them. Now, when it came to my mother's specific assignments for the An Myorio, this was in cooperation with the Kempei Tai. The Kempei Tai literally translates into the English as thought police. It's where George Orwell got the term for his novel, Thought Police in 1984 where he also speaks of East Asia, which aspires towards an elimination of the self in his remembrance of 
the kamikaze tactics. So when it comes to uh, why George Orwell used that term to generate fear, is because the Kempeitai, the thought police of Japan, were Hirohito's Gestapo. And um, they were, of course, used all over Asia. And uh, they were the police who had power over the military. They would investigate the military when it came to corruption. So they were feared by all. They answered directly to the emperor. And one of the greatest problems that the Japanese were confronted with was the fact that the Americans were diabolic, evil in the extreme, dedicated to the anti-gods, which we will go into. But understand that when it comes to this kind of warfare, this kind of secret war involving the occult, involving uh, the uh, just, it's not just cultures, or bloodlines, we're talking about attempts to control the destiny of evolution, humanity itself. The important thing to remember for anyone who suffered under communism in Bulgaria, everyone knows the horrors of communism, what it was like to live under Soviet oppression, Soviet oppression in which entire cultures were forced to Russify, uh, grow up learning the Russian language, uh, basically buying all their crappy products, uh, having no alternatives in life, and uh, being told that somehow this was an utopia, uh, that someday it would all get better. Uh, imagine someone being so crazy to live in freedom as to want that lifestyle. That's how crazy the Americans were. All the Americans were fighting for communism. Franklin Delano Roosevelt made his vice president, and bear in mind, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a very, very sick man. We're not just talking mentally ill, as in psychotic and pathological. Physically, he was extraordinarily sick. We're talking a man about a man who was just so profoundly sick that he was in a wheelchair, and every day he was living was declared could be his last. So when we talk about, uh, I believe her name was Jean Dixon, she was his occult advisor. Uh, and uh, I'm going to look that up just to make sure I've got that right. Uh, but he had an occult advisor with a crystal ball. Uh, and uh, I believe it was Jean Dixon who was his uh, personal occult advisor. Matter of fact, I know that to be true. So Jean Dixon was a woman who literally would go into the White House with a crystal ball, and she ran World War II for the Americans. This is something no American has ever taught, but I worked with all the secret documents that proved it to be true. And anybody can look it up. People will look up that Jean Dixon was allowed to go into the White House to see President Roosevelt personally about the war. That's something people can look up on their own. But you need to understand that no person could do that without the highest level of security clearance. So Gene Dixon had the security clearance of a top general in the US Armed Forces. What most people don't know is that she ran the war for the Americans. She would go in and tell Roosevelt what to do. Because he asked. He'd say, what do I do? And she'd give him the advice. And understand that every time he would ask her, how long have I got to live? And she would put her fingers together like you're playing a tiny violin. And she'd always say, that much. <laughs> every time she saw him, she was telling him, you could tie any second. Every breath you take should be your last. And ultimately, he did die in office. Now, his vice president, the man who was supposed to take over 
was a card-carrying member of the American Communist Party. Henry Agard Wallace. And Henry Agard Wallace was determined to collectivize American agriculture on the Soviet's model, eliminate all industrial business, nationalize all private property, and Sovietize the American economy, eliminate all rival parties, and put everything under the single Communist Party state. This was his stated objective. This is why American industrialists had tried to overthrow Roosevelt when he was elected. They tried to hire a Marine, Smedley Butler, who took their money and then turned them in. But because they were the only people providing employment at the time that America was in the Great Depression, Roosevelt couldn't do anything to them. He needed them to produce munitions and armaments for his war, so he couldn't touch them. But all stupid Americans think Smedley Butler is a hero when he was a card-carrying communist. And him and Henry Wallace wanted to take over America and render it a Soviet satellite state of the Soviet Union. So just months before Roosevelt died, the American government desperately threw out Henry Wallace and put in Harry Truman. Harry Truman never met Roosevelt, or rather, he met him only once in the month before he died for a photo opportunity. A photograph was taken of the two of them together, but Roosevelt was too sick to talk to him, too sick to say a word. In fact, when Roosevelt won his fourth election, his fourth term in office as president, his Marine Corps son was holding him up from behind like a puppet because he had fainted. He was taking the congratulations from the audience for winning his fourth presidential term when he collapsed and his son held him up from behind like he was a mannequin. Kept his completely spent body standing up artificially and then literally backed him up away from the cameras and walked him back away so nobody could see the man was completely unconscious. It was, how, how is that connected to, to the Armada and uh, the Japanese and Germans? and uh, During the time that the Jews. Roosevelt was president, the two things happened. One was that they had heard that the golden child was born in Mongolia. This is what the Tibetan Buddhists said would be the return of the Maitreya, the Buddha that would save mankind. The Americans referred to it as the Christ child. Henry Agard Wallace was sent to Mongolia with United States Special Operations Forces to kill the Christ child, bring the blood back to Roosevelt to drink so that his illness would be cured and he would become immortal. Wow. They were dispatched into Mongolia where anyone can look this up. You had the vice president of the United States in the middle of a war in enemy territory behind enemy lines. In Mongolia. And nobody ever asks why. Nobody ever does any research. My mother was sent to counter this operation. Along with units of the Kempe Tai and Japanese ninja commandos. So at this point in history, you've got to stop imagining them as you would in a, in a popular martial arts film and think of the ninja as military commandos in the more conventionally armed and armored sense. Bulletproof armor, which the Japanese did wear throughout the China theater. And uh, 
paratroop capable. They were flown in and dispatched to try and find the Christ child before Henry Wallace could and his American troops. Now, they failed at one operation, but succeeded at another. The one thing they knew was that the Americans were traveling around by their own form of dirigible, much more primitive than anything the Germans or the Japanese had. Henry Agard Wallace, of course, had been guided by Nicholas Rorik, a Russian spy, a theosophical guru. Rorik was the man who had introduced Henry Wallace to mystical communism. And when it came to the idea of mystical communism, they felt they could eliminate all individuality in man. That man would become like a giant hive mind, like the ants or the termites or other social insects. Henry Agard Wallace, of course, was a multi-billionaire. Their fortune was made of GMO, genetically modified organisms, in the 1930s. They were increasing corn crop yields by crossbreeding and inbreeding. They were working in 1922, the year before my mother was born with a Chinese strain and one supplied by the plant geneticist, Donald Jones, producing hybrid corn. They started Pioneer Hybrid, H-I-B-R-E-D, a hybrid seed company. And thanks to genetically modified organisms, he became one of the richest families on earth. He wanted to collectivize all the crops so that they would grow only his seed, without which everyone would starve because he controlled the genetic blueprint. This man was set to become America's president, but not until he could prove himself by killing the Christ child. Now, there's something I will tell you now that I've never said before. That when the Americans captured the golden child, my mother was under orders that they could not take him back alive. There was no way at that point the Japanese could save him. The Americans were bringing him on to the dirigible to take back to America alive, where they could bleed him dry so that Roosevelt could drink his blood. My mother gave the order to the sniper who blew the child's head off. They couldn't allow wow. that to happen. Then the sniper was ordered to keep pounding bullets into the boy so all the blood would drain out immediately. The sniper in rapid succession pumped as many bullets as he could. Half a hundred into that child's body to the point where the Americans simply threw the body out from the dirigible. But if she hadn't done that, Roosevelt would have had the blood of the Christ child to drink. This is what war leads to. After that, the Americans went for their secondary objective. Vinyaga. Understand that the Sanskrit word Nyaga simply means serpent, a symbol of wisdom in Vedic Indian culture. But its true origin is based on the existence of a small number of intelligent serpents, enormous, the size of the ancient prehistoric megaboas that could enwrap, crush, and swallow dinosaurs, and did so for millions of years. These supermassive megaboa-sized serpents have existed on Earth coeval with humanity before his development and evolution, and then thereafter. When they were trapped by the tides of time, as many retreated into the inner earth, 
They left a few upon the surface, living as gods in isolated temples, all but forgotten by modern civilization. It was said by the time of my mother's life that there were only nine Naga, nine Yaga in all the world, almost all of which can be found in remote temples in India, Pakistan, and Nepal. They have lived in these sanctuaries for centuries, tended by human servants to whom they impart the wisdom only millennia Alden creatures can. Now, this wisdom is literally physically dispensed in venom from the fangs of the Nyaga. One ounce of this substance, known as Nyaga milk, when properly prepared and imbibed, grants a human psionic visions, visions and also precognitive abilities the ability to foretell the future accurately. Empathy, precognition, psychometry. The various qualifications we have for this kind of technique that takes disciplined occultists years to perfect is just blossoming because the certain areas of the reptilian cortex within all human beings is blown wide open by Nyaga venom, the milk, as it's called, by the cultists who tend them. And the choice is really up to the Nyaga, though it does entertain suitably humble requests. Many of the Nyaga's human servants live their entire lives waiting for a taste of Nyaga milk, but never touch a single drop. Now, the Nyaga are particularly susceptible to fluctuations in the space-time continuum. And when it's exceptionally low, then they enter a kind of hibernation. And their sleep can last for centuries, during which time their followers wait faithfully for the reawakening of their divine masters. I guess they they were very active at Angkor Wat in Cambodia once. Perhaps, perhaps. By the way, I hear a lot of chuckling in the background and laughter. I was just wondering, is there something particularly amusing uh, that I'm no, bringing No, be- because your stories are so fascinating and uh, out of the blue that <laughs> we're always blown blown away. <laughs> Understood. Humor. Yeah. <laughs> when, it's when, in Yaga, or... when it first awakes, after it sheds its old skin, this is a process that requires several days. And during this time, and for approximately about a fortnight, a fortnight or 14 nights, two weeks thereafter, the Nyaga is particularly vulnerable, having effectively no armor and only half its usual strength. Now, the legends among followers say that in times past, ruthless individuals took advantage of the Nyaga's weakness and forced them to give up their milk. And the legends further state that these people were driven irrevocably insane by the precognitive dreams they suffered. But this is what my mother and her team were confronted with in terms of Henry Wallace's next objective. There was a remote temple in India where they were sent to interdict, meaning get there before the Americans. Uh, to demand an audience in the name of the emperor with the temple's master, a supposedly 10,000-year-old monk named Anantha. Now, they were told the monk was expecting them. But when they arrived, the temple worshippers told them that the evil Americans arrived and carried off their lord, Ananta in what they described as one of the Vedas, the flying machines of ancient India, or how they understood it. This, of course, was the dirigible. And they begged my mother and her team to find their master and bring him home. So where they truly succeeded 
in the most definable sense, inarguable sense, was that they were able to bring down the dirigible and rescue the Nyaga, after which the enormous serpent was brought home to his temple. Unfortunately, Henry Wallace was not in that dirigible. Apparently, he had left ahead of time to return home. But at least the Nyaga was rescued. My mother was actually awarded with drops of the venom, which enabled her to have a kind of recognition for the rest of her life, as well as giving her visions of what the future would be and what would happen to a point where she knew a great deal about the world that she otherwise never would have dreamed of. Do you know this story from her? It was from her. Wow. And of course, understand that there were rumors in certain parts of Japan. Most people in Japan would never know of this. Most people in Japan know how extensive the war was. The Japanese were everywhere. Very few know the extent of how important the struggle was, what the struggle was truly about. If the Nyaga had been brought home to America, it would have been paraded as a freak like King Kong and dissected like an animal. The Americans would have stripped it of what venom that they could in an attempt to scientifically reproduce it. At which point the Americans would have had control of the future, theoretically. If the Americans can't imagine that they've lost the war, perhaps these experiences will show them how much they truly lost. So hopefully that puts some of your questions about the warring bloodlines and the supernatural aspects of the war into a perspective that will help to make people more aware of why the Americans and the Soviets were so afraid to let the world know that they had lost and dedicated their entire social machine to the maintenance of a lie. Yeah, the only moment that left and I say unclear, was about uh, the Jews and the Japanese and, and the Germans uh, and the official narrative that uh, Hitler was, was um, exterminating them. And this is a good point to... Be happy to go back to, to it. Yeah, Would you like we to can go, go back to, to that now? Yeah, we can go to the Israel topic uh, in general. Can you, can you cover why is Israel so important uh, that the whole history of the world is still gravitating for centuries around it. Absolutely. Where's the where's the beginning of that conflict between uh, these bloodlines and what is I'll Israel? answer to the best of my ability. And um, I'm sorry, you said where's the beginning of that conflict between the bloodlines and what else did you say? What is Israel in in its core? What what do we what we don't know about Israel because we obviously don't understand that topic at all. Thank you. I'll do my best to uh, do that justice. Before I forget. I will emphasize this, that uh, uh, understand that despite their vast wisdom and the legions of worshippers, the Nyaga are not, never were particularly well disposed towards human beings because they find our species savage and ruthless and feel that only through several lifetimes of prayer and meditation can humans ever begin to truly understand the lessons the Nyaga teach them. Mm. So consequently, the Nyaga never reacted favorably to humans who were not part of their temple. And that uh, when Yaga were accosted in their sanctum, of course they would automatically assume uh, that the strange humans wish them harm and react uh, by separating the intruders and dispatching them one at a time in their labyrinthine temple complexes using telepathic powers of suggestion to lure the interlopers into the mazes, the passages of their temples where traps would await or waiting for one to be alone, after which they would use their stare to paralyze the target and enwrap them and constrict them. Uh, now, of course, 
uh, they would be loath to use their bite, uh, even though the milky venom was a kind of very powerful neurotoxin, simply because the human would essentially be receiving a gift for free. The reason I bring this up is to explain why the Nyaga was unable to defend itself, as I said, was at the time of Henry Wallace and his mission into Mongolia and Tibet and uh, Inner Asia, the sanctums of Pakistan, really, uh, that uh, the Nyaga had shed its skin and was completely helpless. That was hopefully made clear so that people understand normally that's not the case for the Nyaga. And please don't go looking for them. It's really not to your benefit. Yeah. That being said, as well, understand that my mother was trusted with these missions because she was also beyond baseline human, uh, half vampire, as I had explained in the past. We may return to that um, in this discussion, but the first thing we'll cover is the Jews. Yeah, just and, because you mentioned the serpent beings again, uh, there's this mythological motif uh, about... Uh, big gold deposits and treasures guarded by the serpent being. Do you mm -hmm. have a comment on that? Yes, I want people to understand that this is the kind of this is the kind of way that humans would see the wisdom that mm -hmm. the Nyaga offer. The great treasure that the Nyaga offer is not material, but humans would think of it in terms of the material profit they could make there from. So oftentimes the myth becomes that the great serpent is guarding material treasure. And nothing could be more ridiculous. Uh, this is simply humans trying to materialize or interpret, in terms of what matters to them, the wisdom the Nyaga have to offer that could enable them to profit therefrom to the point where they would manifest that those amounts of treasure by exploiting the Nyaga. Does that make sense? Yeah. So to hydrate myself a little bit first before yeah. I get into a rather complicated topic. <laughs> we just want to thank you that you shared this story about your mother and the golden child. We appreciate it. It's the first time we hear it and it's amazing. Thank you. I appreciate that. You, you always come up with something absolutely mind-blowing. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Thank you. Well, understand, of course, that the one benefit you have, or I have, from living a life of unmitigated horrors is you're never short of a story to tell. <laughs> that's, <laughs> um, uh, that's the one thing I can say. Uh, that, and coming from a background of two parents who had lived through so much, same thing, doubled by orders of magnitude. So with that um, in being stated, uh, the important thing to understand is that we're going to go a little bit back in a sense to the, um, where, the, where we were in the last episode when we spoke of the Magi in China. And understand that one of the things I brought up was um, the so-called three kings. There were actually a dozen of them, uh, fully 13 from China. Uh, they followed the star child who they reference in a work that ultimately languished in the Vatican library for centuries, hundreds of years. And this was before a specialist in the language of Syriac, one of the languages spoken in Christ's time, uh, was able to uh, rescue it. Uh, obviously, he was given permission uh, by the Vatican Library, and uh, he was able to translate it upon rescuing it from obscurity. And uh, the work is known as the Revelation of the Magi, and it is available in English, uh, so this is an ancient manuscript that was literally written, uh, at least put to print, to text, I mean to say, writ down about a hundred years after Christ's death, which for all intents and purposes was during his lifetime. It should have been a part of the Bible, but became what is known as Apocrypha, not entered into the Bible. But if it were entered into the Bible, the Bible would never have been as confusing as it is. 
So understand that uh, Brent Landau was the man who interpreted it. Landau spelled L-A-N-D-A-U. And people can look all that up themselves. The reason it's important is because he speaks of literally an invasion from China following what they called his star, meaning his star, Christ's star. Christ appears as a child in their eyes, in their minds. The vampire mage kings of China were following the Christ child who appeared at a different age in each of their minds. Each one of them saw him as a different age of child, but they called the star they followed in their minds, not a physical star in the sky, but the star they could see in their mind's eye that navigated them and their armies through the desert. They called it his star. This is exactly how Nostradamus, centuries later, would refer to my biological sire, my biological father, Adolf Hitler, as his star. So that same tradition is where Nostradamus is hinting at Adolf Hitler as a form of Christ. And this is something that most Americans did not understand, but certainly Joseph Goebbels did when he had Nostradamus's works interpreted into the German. When it came to the revelation of the Magi and why that's important. The Magi invaded Rome at the height of its power, and the Romans could do nothing about it. The Magi demanded to see the Christ child so they could ultimately coronate him, the Christ being a title, not a name. Jesus was simply known as Jesus, son of Joseph. It was the vampire mage kings out of China who made him Christ. They coronated him, sanctified him, recognized him the Messiah. This proves that Christianity is not Jewish. Christianity is before Judaism. The mage kings out of China themselves had been influenced by Seth, the righteous third son of Adam, who, when the garden fell, took a Chinese woman as a bride when he went east and Christianized the early vampire mage kings. Vampirism being not afraid of the cross at all. That misunderstanding is perversion from the Turks. An important point to be made here is one of the greatest heroes of Christendom was Vladislav Sepish, of course, known in the West as Dracula. Dracula was his knight, knighted title. His father was simply known as Dracul, or the dragon, a title that was proferred upon him by the emperor of the First Reich, the Holy Roman Germanic Reich of Emperor Sigismundus of Luxembourg, who gave a mass order to exterminate werewolves throughout the Reich. The knights were rallied to do that. His father was one of them. Dracula inherited the throne upon his father's assassination after he escaped a childhood in slavery to the Turks. He became such a great crusader, but he needed money to keep his war going, and the East was impoverished. He converted to Roman Catholicism and was excommunicated by the Byzantine Orthodox faith. But the Pope of the West hailed him as the athlete of Christ. He would have been the man to liberate Byzantium, which had fallen to the Turks. Understand that because the Romanian Orthodox Church had excommunicated him, he was condemned by their tradition to reanimate as a vampire. But he was still a guardian of Christendom. 
When people would encounter him in his own death, they would raise the sign of the cross. Because no Jew or Muslim would ever do this, all such people were allowed to pass. The cross is not a ward against vampires. It's a pass that was allow an allowance for a Christian to pass because the vampires are the guardians of Christendom. The first movie to portray Dracula as a dog, because Muslims believe dogs to be filthy vermin. There's a reason for this. If we go into the ghoul later in this discussion, dogs are scared to death of ghouls and are no protection against them. So they're viewed as useless throughout <laughs> Dural Islam or the land of submission to Allah. So the first person to turn Dracula into a dog with canine fangs was not the movies of Biela Lugosi, those produced by Universal Studios that portrayed Biela Lugosi as Dracula, you can see he has no fangs. The first people to put fangs upon Dracula and make him like a dog were the Turks in the movie Dracula in Istanbul, produced in the 1950s. Then after that, every vampire movie portrayed vampires with fangs, as if they were dogs, just the way the Muslims like to see them. How stupid you Christians are. You don't even know your own protectors, the subspecies which crowned your king of kings, the guardians of your very Christendom. You obey the Muslims and dehumanize them as no better than dogs. You make me sick. Well, at the time the vampire mages invaded Rome, the man who truly feared them and what they represented was the Edumane, the Edomite. Herod, Herod Magnus, or Herodos the Great. The patriarch of the dynasty installed by the Romans. The Edomites occupied the land south of the Dead Sea. They were the descendants of Esau, the older twin brother of Jacob, whom God later renamed Israel, whose 12 sons became the fathers of the 12 tribes. Now this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan. And what happened, of course, was in order to take charge of Jerusalem, destroy it culturally because of the fanaticism of the zealots, the people whom the Romans would later fight at Masada. These were terrorists of their day. Jewish nationalists who wanted to overthrow the Roman Empire. And they targeted Roman soldiers or civilians and killed them. When such a terrorist group was forced into retreat on the mountain of Masada, the Romans didn't massacre them in a siege. They all killed themselves. A truly fanatical cult. One of them, the early zealots, was Barabbas, who was taken in under arrest for murder. Not a thief, but a killer. Pontius Pilate's wife had a dream that Christ was the Messiah. This was predicted by Virgil, the great Roman poet, who said the golden child, the Christ would come. This is why Virgil was portrayed by Dante as the guide throughout the underworld for the hero who stormed the gates of hell itself. So Christ was predicted by the Roman poets. Thus the wife of Pontius Pilate said, do not harm this man. Pontius Pilate took him before the Jews as was required by custom where he was required by popular demand to release one of their criminals and said, 
Shall I release this murderer, Barabbas, a terrorist? Or this man, Christ, who has done no wrong? And the Jews said, give us Barabbas. After which Pontius Pilate said, I wash my hands of this. Thus it went down in Christian history that the Jews killed Christ. Now the Jews themselves had provided an extraordinarily valuable service to the royalty of the world. They had produced a certain dye, unique in color, it blue. So valuable, it was worth 20 times its weight in gold. This mysterious blue color was actually produced from the Murex trunculus snail, a sea creature described in the Bible in a way you would never think of it as a snail, referred to as a hilozon. It has the shape of the sea, having bones and able to attack and grab its prey by entangling it with its legs that emerge from its mouth. This is the actual Talmudic description from God himself. When the snail is killed, the flesh is boiled and fermented and out of its shell will emerge a single drop of purple, which through an alchemical atomic process will be transmuted into what is known as Teclet Blue. It's mentioned 49 times in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. When you expose the purple to the sun during the light of day, you get blue, which is technically speaking called Dibro Moi So Indigo. Divergence. Try saying that three times fast. Dibro moi, so indigo. The very name implies that two bromine atoms are knocked out, the sunlight breaking the bond between the indigo molecule and the bromine molecule. That's an atomic process that knocks out the colorant that makes the purple and turns it into blue. This is all real chemistry, but it's an alchemical process. Only by such being employed at the nuclear level and exposing that purple color to the sun, could one get the color of God, the color of the sky, the color of the sea. And if you were to look at the sky and the sea, like my legal father, the man who raised and guided me, did all his life as a sailor, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, you'd see two shades of blue that were the foundation of life itself. You see God every day as a sailor. If you were to try and capture either the sea or the sky in a container, you don't see the blue. All you see is translucent, clear liquid or oxygen. This is what the atheist sees. The non-believer in God sees that invisibility captured in a container and says there is no God. It's only by looking at the sea and the sky itself you feel the divinity, the creator, and that sense of godliness which renders life meaningful. This is why that blue is so important. This is why the Israelis try and show a taste of that blue on their national flag. Everything else is white. The nasty side effect. There's a price to pay for everything. When Tekelet blue is produced, the death and fermentation of all those snails produces an unbearable stench. Anyone married to such a specialist in alchemical dyeing has the right of divorce by Talmudic law. Producing Tekelet Blue was all you would do for the rest of your life. No one would cohabitate with you because you were taking the blood of the Hilozon and producing an unbearable stench, and such was the price of God's work. Now, God wanted his priests to be attired with this particular blue. But then what happened was Christ was born. When Christ was born and the vampire mage kings invaded the Roman Empire to coronate him the king of kings, 
that they had known of from before the time of the Jews. Herod, the Edomite blood enemy of the Jewish people, was made aware that this was the heir to the Davidian throne, the Davidian bloodline, and that the throne of David belonged to Christ. Hence, he became known as the Antipater, the Antifather, the man of the genetic line of the kings of Edom, who gave the order to kill all firstborn children in Roman Palestine, all firstborn sons. Kill them all to make certain we kill the Christ, the man who would have killed your God if you're a Christian. But Christ was ordered by the vampire mages to escape. His parents took him away. And thousands and thousands of young boys died. Now this abdication by the throne of any true king of Israel represented the end times. When man would be misled by his search for the Helazon at the end of the world. The Jews under Herod, who took advantage of the oil money of the time. Understand, when I brought up the past before that was destroyed by the Mongols, the past when the Baghdad Khalifa, the Caliphate, under the Persians and Iran, Iran being but the Greek word for Aryan. When the Aryan Caliphate had its industrial revolution based on oil, had developed mechanisms, the degenerate versions thereof that became the Turkish automatic chess players the Europeans encountered. When they were able to get artificial intelligence encapsulated, the so called genie in a bottle, where it was murder to unplug a machine. All of this industrial revolution based on petroleum instead of coal and steam lost under the Muslim massacres. Lost to mankind possibly forever. Under the Herodian massacre, the Jews lost the technology of the Hilozon, the technology to alchemically produce the Tekelet Blue. Herod was a madman who knew one thing. The zealots would take his life at any opportunity. So he ordered fortresses built throughout Israel, Roman Palestine, within the reach of wherever he was at any given time, so that he could run and hide, secure himself, fortress himself, bunker himself whenever necessary. He was the great builder. How was all this done? Well, in those days, before the age of steam, the age of coal, the nuclear age, the age of oil, the various forms of power that we use, this was the age of sinew. The energy at that time was muscular electricity, human slaves, and one of the Powerhouses of the world in slave trade was Roman Palestine. So all of this was built by slavery. Herod became master of the Jewish slave trade. The center point between Europe and Asia and Africa was the Levantine. Herod grew fat and wealthy off the sale of human flesh. All of it used to fortress Israel. The man who would have killed your God. The man who caused the loss of the Helozon technique. Now, when H.P. Lovecraft, a gay man, wanted to grow himself a beard, as the gay community in America calls it, meaning get himself a wife so that he would look straight, heterosexual, 
to the public. He made a deal with the Jewess who was in Ukraine, the Ukraine. And this incredible woman who was a product of a very religious Jewish family, Sonia Green, decided she would marry H.P. Lovecraft so she could get United States citizenship. And she taught him about the Hilozon. Now at times, Howard Phillips Lovecraft, who himself was ultimately of Arab descent, something he never spoke of publicly, but his original descendants who came to the United States were named Hazard. Hazard as in danger. Hazard traces back to the Arab word for red, as in the color signifying danger. As in Hazred. Abdullah al-Hazred. The author of the Necronomicon. Howard Phillips Lovecraft was a descendant of this man. By the time they had anglicized their name to Lovecraft, all that had generally been hidden from the public eye. Only open through genealogies traced at Department of Defense exp expense, paid for by American taxpayers under the orders of Michael Aquino himself. So here you have this Arab descended New English gentleman marrying a Jewess, sometimes going off on a Judeophobic rant, complaining about the Jews and their power in America. His wife Sonia Green would say, well, you remember I am Jewish, do you not? At which he would turn to her and say, you are not a Jewess. You are Mrs. Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Now, ultimately, they would be divorced. But she had taught him a great deal about Judaism that gave him his knowledge of the anti-gods. Just to put this in perspective, can you make the difference for the public between the Jews and the Edomites? This is what I'm getting to. Okay. We'll get there. Understand that, of course, the Edomites were, well, Think of Adam. Adam was the first Caucasian man, the first man in the sense of an expanded consciousness caused by a comprehension of time in the chronological sense, meaning he had to instigate calendrical timekeeping because he was a farmer. His tribe became the first farming tribe, the first agricultural tribe. This was in the Aryan lands. This was in the lands of Iran, the Greek word for Aryan, in the northernmost region of what would be Azerbaijan or the Azeri ethnic homelands in Iran today, near Tabriz. This is where Eden was. He was known as Adam because white people blush. There is no other ethnicity that has that trait. Only among Caucasian people does blood appear in the face in a blush, hence the term rud or ruddy, as in red, a reddening of the face. This is something that is important because there were pre-Adamic races of much darker melanin, darker skin colors. The white skin color evolved as man migrated north so that the paler skin would better absorb vitamin D and humanity would not die of rickets from basically malnourishment because the body cannot produce its own vitamin D. It requires it from the sun. So Adam and his tribe, Adamu, because of the red soil that they tilled, became the first to have to keep track of time chronologically so they would know when to sow after they would plant. Until that time, man was not conscious as we understand it. Man was in an Edenic sense of hunter-gathering state. Consciousness was in the moment, almost as unto an animal. This was how Adam was in 
a sense, the first man. It was in this Garden of Eden, of course, that the vision of the Christ child was had, the birth of proto-Christianity. His righteous third son, Seth, would then migrate east to bring that to the Chinese. When it came to that color red as in Adam, just as his son Seth is a righteous name that is satanically inverted by the anti-god Seth of Egypt. Understand that Michael Aquino had so much control over American media through the Department of Defense that they could crush any film. Enki Bilal was an artist from the Slavic Southlands, Bulgaria, and Serbia. In between those two nations, Enki Bilal was born, an artist who was famous for European graphic novels, what Americans would call comic books. Enki Bilal made a film called Immortal in France. This film should have made his career. It was about Horus, one of the ancient Egyptian gods returning to Earth. Then oh, there was I watched film, it. it. It was animation, right? Partially animated, yes. Yeah, partially yeah. filmed, partially animated, yes. And big pyramid over New York City, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was it. He was one of the people I learned illustration from. Oh, uh, not personally, but through correspondence. And then there was a film called Gods of Egypt, yep. which portrayed the war between Horus and Seth. Both these films were condemned to complete and total failure. Immortal was never allowed to display in American theaters. It only showed in art theaters off yep. the market. In terms of Gods of Egypt, it failed miserably because all the critics attacked it. Aquino orchestrated this through the Department of Defense. The reason why is because Seth is shown being defeated. The very... Uh -huh. Name of the capital of Egypt, Cairo, means battleground, battlefield, place of battle, meaning the place where Horus defeated Seth, the anti god, the god of pestilential flora, foreigners, and the desert and disease, and death itself in the night. When Seth was defeated by Horus, the golden age of Egypt began with Cairo as its capital. All of this was presented in the film Gods of Egypt, which was immediately attacked by the critics, and it lost millions and millions of dollars, considered a great box office failure because the American government made certain it would never sell. Yeah. Michael Aquino was behind that. That was the amount of power that he had. This is because Seth was never to be shown as defeated as he was in history. They were reading, writing history as they did with World War II. But never confuse Seth the anti-god with Seth the son of Adam, who was the birth of Christianity. Never confuse Adam, whose name means red, with Edom, which is the name for red in the Herodian bloodline. Edom is, of course, the source of Herod himself, whose father and predecessor was Antipater, Antipater meaning the anti-father. And the Romans put him on the throne to destroy Israel, which he did. And one of the things that he did was he led them down the path to worship a false god. Now, Sonia Green had told Lovecraft that she had to leave Ukraine because a great holocaust was coming. A great holocaust that was brought upon by a false Jewish prophet a radical cowboy from the Hasidic Jews known as the Radziner dynasty who played the tragic role in the destiny of the Jewish people. And they identified the source of Tekelet Blue as the cuttlefish. They identified this as the Hilozon because it had no bones, or rather had bones that were, well, were able to shoot forth tentacles from its mouth by which it would capture its prey with its legs, as in the Old Testament. Now, Tekelet Blue 
the blue of God itself. That dye produced from the cuttlefish is exactly the opposite. In fact, the blood from the Cthulhu creature was used to produce Zyklon B gas that was used in the gas chambers. That was the path that the false rabbi led the Jewish people down that Sonia Green had married H.P. Lovecraft to escape that fate from. But the Radziner dynasty pushing the cuttlefish, the false god, Cthulhu, as the advent of messianic times, they were, of course, in league with Mossad, just as there was a United States Marine Corps or a United States Army founded in 1775, as anyone can look up. Before, there was a constitutional republic known as the United States, which was founded in 1776, as anyone can look up. So, too, the Mossad existed before there was an Israel. A terrorist organization dedicated to Zionism. A militant movement born in the decade that my mother was born. Politically orchestrating the circumstances of World War I so as to secure the land in Palestine now recognized as Israel. Now, as a documents destruction specialist for the United States Department of Defense, military historians who state that Germany was the losing end of World War I are again revising history. In other words, completely inverting it satanically and lying. The Germans had defeated the Russians. They had won on the Eastern Front. This is evidenced by the brest litovsk Treaty, which enabled them to gain Ukraine, Belarus, all the territories of white Russia and the borderland of Ukraine. This made Germany the master of Central Europe. And now they turned all these new draftees onto the Western Front to overwhelm the French. That's when the Americans unleashed the American Army and Navy flu. Bred in the cantons of America's heartland. Anyone can look this up. They called it the Spanish flu simply because they all disembarked in nominally neutral Spain in what were called coffin ships because the majority of American soldiers arrived dead. Vectors for the American Army and Navy flu. We explain all of this in the Roswell Deception, but understand that this is what led to 100 million deaths worldwide and shortened the lifespan by 15 years, 10 to 15 years of another 100 million people. The greatest genocide in history perpetrated by the American Army and Navy flu, as it was called in the code books. The so-called Spanish flu. Every flu in the world originates out of Asia. Every flu is a swine flu, an avian flu, an Asian flu, because the Asians are the largest concentration of humanity on Earth the largest concentration of subsistence farmers, which maintain chickens in close proximity to pigs, where chicken roll, pig shit, chicken shit is eaten by the pigs, who then, of course, spread it by their own shit, and humans eat them, both of them, and wind up contracting avian and swine flus that spread to the rest of the world. That's why every flu has an Asian name. But not the Spanish flu, because it was a weapon a bioweapon originating out of America. The cantonments of Kansas, where they shipped criminals from San Quentin Prison in California, drafted them into the army, stuck them in unrefrigerated boxcars with chickens so they inhaled all that powderized chicken shit on the way to Kansas, took the one man who was immune to it, but a carrier made him the cook, infected all the army with it so they would infect the rest of the world, unleashed them into the trenches, and everybody started to die. That's what ended World War I. That's why the Nazis, the National Socialists, and the Fascisti, the fascists of Italy, ordered everyone to return to the greeting of the Ad Locutio, the Roman salute, which everyone called, oh shit, 
So, okay. Here we go again. Let's try this. <laughs> 